everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Uncovering Windows Registry Data and the Latest Mac Artifacts. I'm Julia O'Shea, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager here at Celebrite Enterprise Solutions. Before we get started, there are a few things that I'd like to review. We are recording the webinar today, so we'll share an on-demand version after the webinar is complete. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions window, and we will answer them in our Q&A at the end of the webinar. If we don't get to your question, we will follow up with you after. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers today, Monica Harris and Bob Keeney. Monica is an experienced e-discovery professional, and over the past, past 15 years, she has specialized in the development, implementation, and training of proprietary software for companies such as Kale Discovery and Concilio. Before joining Celebrite, she worked with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, where she oversaw policy and procedure curation, enterprise solution rollout, and training for enterprise for agency litigation and freedom of information requests. Monica is an active leader and mentor in the e-discovery community and currently serves as the president of the Association of Certified e-discovery specialists, ACIDS DC chapter, a board member of the master's conference and committee chair of the DC master's conference. She has served as assistant director for the women in e-discovery DC chapter and collaborates frequently with the DC women in e-discovery DC bar and women's bar association of DC. Bob has been working in cross-platform software development for over 20 years. Throughout his career, he has consulted in a wide range of industries and spent 20 years as the owner of Bikini Software. He has spoken at dozens of cross-platform software development conferences around the world and has a regular column in a cross-platform development magazine. He is also passionate about first robotics and was a mentor for 13 years. Thank you both for joining us today, Bob and Monica. If you both are ready, I'll hand it over to you, Monica, so you can get started. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar, Uncovering Windows Registry Data and the Latest Mac Artifacts. For today's webinar, we're going to talk about how to get the full picture for DFER, uh, including those Windows Registry and Mac artifacts, as well as Windows artifacts as well. Starting with some stats for a Digital Forensics Incident Response, or DFER. Including security breaches, which have increased by 11% since 2018 and 67% since 2014. So as a trend over time, we can definitely see a significant increase there. The average time to identify a breach in 2019, right before the pandemic started, was 206 days. And then the average life cycle of a breach is now 314 days. That's from breach to containment. So some helpful information there. So let's start by talking about Windows registry data and how that can help investigators because the proof is in the hives. Windows registry data can be a cornucopia of information on the who, what, where, and when something took place on a system that can directly link a bad actor to the actions being investigated. It is the database that contains the default settings, user, and system-defined settings for Windows computers. For accounts, the Windows registry will store user information, including the time they use the system. When you tie that into internet browser information, nefarious activity can be quickly uncovered. If a user visited a suspicious site, for example, attempting to cover their tracks, the smoking gun could be found in the Windows registry. If that same bad actor installed software from the nefarious site, the Windows registry could also be a prime investigation source. In addition to the Windows registry, we also have Windows artifacts, including feature usage. Feature usage can give insight into a user's behavior, such as how often they switch between applications, look at the Windows clock, or start the Start menu, or click on the Start menu, and items on the taskbar. Feature usage is also another way of confirming software that has been run interactively by an account and how many times the software was run. 
By analyzing the feature usage, a DFER professional may be able to further validate their findings with other known artifacts to help strengthen their findings during an investigation. And last but not least, internet log parsing, the gold mine of DFER. When conducting DFER, browsers are a gold mine. They are often the source of incidents and malware, which can be traced down using the artifacts found inside of the browsers. From the navigation history to download files, browsers are a critical piece in any forensics analysis. So now to take a look at the Windows registry and Windows artifacts, Bob, I'll turn it over to you for a demo. Thank you, Monica. Thank you everybody for attending the webinar today. We're going to talk about some Windows artifacts right now, and we'll jump first into the registry. You know, the registry has a lot of information. Uh, almost everything you could ever think about in the computer is in there somewhere. There's system information, there's user information, security, and so on. Uh, it's big. There's, there's millions of rows of data to look through. So an experienced investigator can find some interesting things uh, by knowing what to search for. And I'm gonna start off by searching for cookies to save. And the reason I'm doing this is if somebody wipes their computer history or their internet history, um, they may not have other things. But since this is in the registry, a lot of applications don't actually clear this. So we're going to try it out and see what happens. So as you can see, we came up with a hit on cookies to save, and we can look at the value data here. And we see that there's a, a number of websites that, uh, that we have saved cookies for. Now, a lot of websites will save cookies without the user even knowing it. So uh, we click on it and we can see down here in the hex data that it's cookies to save. And we click on the next one and we can actually see some of the raw data. Now this data is actually coming from ntuser.dat, which is pretty common for most computers. So we saw CCleaner here, which is a application that many people use to wipe their computer. So if you want to get something, get rid of data that you don't necessarily want other people to see, you can run CCleaner. Sometimes it affects the registry. Sometimes it just affects software. Sometimes it's just files. So let's take a little dive deeper. So let's take a little deeper dive into CCleaner to see what the registry says about it. So you can see that uh, we've got some things here and we're in the flat list. I'm gonna move to the hierarchy. And we can see that under software, We've got an entry for CCleaner, and we can see that it was run on April 12th. And that's kind of interesting because um, that points us to some other things. And um, so very important to be able to look at the registry and to be able to search the key names, value names, and value data for little bits and pieces of information that might be useful. If there are no other questions, I will move on to um, the next part, which will be the internet browser data. Okay, so under, sorry, under internet, we are going to see, um, we've got all this data available. So bookmarks, cache, cookies, downloads. Because we're interested in CCleaner, let's see what this user has downloaded. So we can see that uh, right here we have BitTorrent. That might be interesting. Uh, they've downloaded Edge, Firefox, and Chrome, and Brave, which leads us to all sorts of questions of why is this user using so many different browsers? So. And then down here, we can see that they attempted to download uh, CCleaner twice. So once they actually did it, and once that uh, they try started it but did not uh, finish it. And as you can see, you know we have cookies and cache and form data, um, and these are all little things that can help an investigator find more information from the user's browser. So unless they've specifically 
deleted these files and information, there might be a wealth of information here. Okay. So uh, with that, I think, unless there are any questions, um, I'm going to switch over to featured usage. Now, featured usage is a interesting phenomenon on Windows. So uh, users can pin items to the taskbar in Windows, and these are the applications that you would use most often. And that way you don't have to go to the start menu or type for it or whatever. It's just, it's just there because it's so easy. It's one click and the Windows operating system actually keeps track of all those. So we can see some data here. So the app badge updated, that would indicate um, things like downloads complete or how many unread messages somebody has in email uh, application. The app uh, launch here shows how many times uh, that the application that was pinned to the taskbar was run. Uh, the app switch shows how many times um, it was just left clicked on the taskbar. The show jump view is the number of times that the application was right clicked in the taskbar. And then finally the trade button click would show us how many uh, times that they've clicked for the clock or the start button, et cetera. So this can show us some interesting uh, usage patterns. So we'll just sort this by uh, the app launch column. And you can see that we've used uh, Windows Explorer uh, quite a few times. And because there's two entries, this may mean, um, well, actually, there's probably a good explanation for this. So here's NT user that, and then here's Windows old. So the reason why there's two entries is this shows us that the, the user uh, installed Windows and then reinstalled Windows and then kept using it. So again, this might lead us to other questions of why did somebody uh, install Windows twice? You know, it's not an uncommon thing to do, but um, it's a good question that might lead to other uh, answers. So you can see Chrome uh, was downloaded and uh, Slack gave us a lot, a bunch of, uh, of, of badge updates. And again, these are all just patterns that help us understand what the user is doing. So between the registry and the internet data and the feature usage, you can kind of get a feel for what a user uh, is doing on their Windows machine. And with that, unless there are any particular questions for Windows, I will hand it back to Monica. Thanks, Bob. And now let's talk about the latest Mac artifacts, starting with Apple Screen Time. Starting with Apple Screen Time and Apple Wallet. Apple introduced the Screen Time feature with the release of iOS 12 in September of 2018. The feature empowers users with insight into how they are spending time with apps and websites, creating detailed weekly and daily activity reports that show the total time spent in each app, usage across categories of apps, number of notifications received, and how often a person picks up their iPhone or iPad. Screen time monitors usage data. Screen time monitors usage data. Investigators can use this data to narrow down the usage of an app to a time window that is as narrow as one hour or as wide as five hours. For Apple Wallet, with more than 127 million users, Apple Wallet and specifically Apple Pay, a form of cryptocurrency, is one of the most popular contactless payment systems. Apple Pay serves as a digital wallet digitizing users' payment cards and completely replacing traditional swipe in and sign and chip and pin transactions. However, unlike traditional wallets, Apple Pay also keeps detailed information about the user's point of sale transactions, including location. And last but not least, Apple Maps, the default map system of iOS. It provides directions and estimated times of arrival for driving, walking, cycling, and public transportation navigation. Over the years, Apple has added proactive location 
proactive location suggestions, integration with public transportation, 3D maps, integration with ride sharing services like Lyft and Uber, reporting accidents, hazards, and speed checks. All this information and more can help investigators track bad actors through their day-to-day -day activities. And with that, Bob, I'll turn it over to you to share the latest Mac artifacts in a demo. Thank you, Monica. We will start looking at the Apple Screen Time. And Apple Screen Time uh, basically shows us what the user is doing on a weekly basis. So we get this report on our iPhone and Mac about how much time we're spending uh, on the screen. And sometimes this is shared between devices, sometimes it's not. Uh, in this case, we have iPhone data. And so by category, we can do, we can sort by minutes, and we can see that they spent 36 minutes um, doing creativity. You know, uh, these are all categories that Apple has made. So they may or may not make a lot of sense, but we can see by our how much time they've spent with each one. Perhaps the most interesting one is counted. So the number of notifications is how many times um, the app has signaled for the user to do something, uh, some notification. Uh, and then certainly number of pickups uh, from that notification and then number of pickups without app usage. So let's, um, let's do a sort on the number of pickups. And we can see that uh, they've been doing some mobile uh, SMS. Um, I'm not sure what bridge is, but they've been looking listening to podcasts and there's a whole wealth of information here so um it's really just a matter of looking through it and getting ideas for what's going on so the other probably the other category that is the most interesting is the time so we can see that uh, let's sort this by uh, app usage minutes and we can see that they've spent 36 minutes in the last week on their camera. So maybe they were filming something, maybe they were taking lots of pictures. Uh, we can see that they, they spent a little bit of time on Tweety2, which is a, a Twitter client. Uh, they spent some time with in Pandora as well. So all these things together uh, can give an idea of what the user has been doing in the last week. And with that, I will move on. If it, because this is with us all the time, Apple Wallet is becoming uh, very popular with users. And uh, this data is not easy to get because uh, no one wants to share their, their data. So we don't have a lot of data. But we can see that uh, on January uh, of 2020, this person uh, got a Starbucks card. And you can see that uh, they've They've enabled some certain things. Uh, depending on uh, when this data was captured, there may actually be uh, location data uh, that you might be able to share on here. But perhaps the most interesting thing is transactions. So we can see that uh, the user spent $15 on January 8th using their American Express card. And we keep going over. Uh, we can see that they were at a Chick-fil-A. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, they got a hot dog at Chick-fil-A. I'm not quite sure why. And then they went to Target uh, a little bit later, and we can see that that was for $9.99. So this is another pattern of what a user was doing. So uh, you've got dates, you've got amounts, you've got the vendor, and uh, you've got all sorts of things. Uh, you can also send money via Apple uh, pay. So um, again, there might be messages in here that uh, uh, could be useful for an investigator to try and find out more information. So now I'm going to switch over to Apple Maps. And Apple Maps is another one of those uh, pieces of information that is really hard to get at because Apple really doesn't want us to uh, to get to it. And we can see here, I'll make this a little bigger, um, we're just showing uh, a whole bunch of different types of data. So we can see bookmark data. So if I'm 
uh, if I'm doing a bookmark uh, in maps, we're seeing it. If I do a pin drop, we're seeing it. And we're even sit getting some direction endpoints. So I'm gonna switch over from the map view to the location list so that we can see uh, a bit more data. So we've talked about the bookmarks, we've talked about the pins, uh, we've done a search. So in this case, uh, they searched for Jack Stack and um, they didn't, well, they did find something, but uh, it's not uh, telling us where it is. Um, but we have directions for the endpoints. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the, the middle endpoints, but uh, it'll give us the, the starting endpoint and the last endpoint pin places, direction search, and we even have failed searches. So we don't know why the search failed. It could be that this address doesn't really exist, or it could be that they had lost an internet connection, which is probably more likely in this case. And um, there's just a lot of wealth of data. So you can find where this person was at. You can be uh, reasonably accurate within, you know, 10, 20 meters of, of where they were at. And um, this is all useful. Investigators love this sort of stuff. And with that, um, I believe that is all of the Apple artifacts we're going to show off. Thank you, Bob. And with that, that concludes our presentation today. And I'll pass the mic back to Julie. Julie? Thanks, Monica. So we have had a few qu questions come in. So let's see here. Let's start with the first one on registry data. Can you show me where this data is located on the user's machine? Right, I can take that one. So because we are uh, searching the entire uh, image for all the various registry hives, um, you can see that this one um, comes from a SAM file uh, in, and again, this is Windows old, so we're getting uh, data from the previous Windows system uh, as well as the new one. And we can see that, that this one will come in, uh, again, this is the old one. But we're just seeing data, here's security. Um, again, this is uh, coming from the various parts of the operating system. And it's going to vary a little bit per system, um, but all the users, all of the hardware and all that uh, are going to be there. Um, and obviously the nice thing about it is you can come in through here and, and search even more data and, and go up and down the hierarchy and, and find uh, additional data. That's great, thanks, Bob. Our next one, okay, in regards to internet browsers, what are some of the reasons a user might be using multiple browsers? For example, why would someone use Brave for just a couple times instead of their usual Opera or Edge browser? Okay, that's a, that's a good one too. Um, Brave has uh, some interesting security features to it where it, uh, it you know, it's claim to fame as privacy and can't be tracked in a lot of cases. So if somebody is using Edge or Opera or Firefox or Safari uh, most of the time and they switch to Brave for, for just a little bit, um, that's probably because they're trying to hide something or maybe they're doing sensitive information that they, they don't want saved. So that would be my guess is why they're, why they're doing that. That makes sense. Okay, how about, let's see. When talking about Apple Maps, why is this data hard to get? So there's two reasons for that. Um, the first one is the file format. So we are uh, decoding what's called protobuf, which is short for protocol buffers. And it was developed by Google. And it's a, oh, it's kind of an extensional, extensionable language format that's a little bit like XML but it's smaller and faster. And as a developer, it's really easy to use, but to get information out of it, we sort of have to reverse engineer what the format is uh, to extract the data out of it. And Monica can probably answer the second part uh, in that um, Apple doesn't make it easy to get the data to begin with. And I'm not quite sure which product it is that can help with that, but 
I'm sure Monica can help. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. That is true. Apple definitely does not make the data easy to collect to begin with. Um, in order to collect this type of data, we recommend uh, that you have a full file system extraction if possible. Um, and at Celebrate, that would be our mobile elite solution. Thanks, Monica. And how about this one on screen time? How long of a time period is screen time good for? Apple reports on Apple screen, screen time uh, every week. Um, so as far as I know, we are, uh, the only data we have is, is based on that weekly usage. And I believe Sunday morning it gets reset. So. Um, if you don't have a lot of data, it could just be that the, the period has been too short or it's just been reset. Great. Well, thanks. That was super helpful. And I appreciate both of your time today. It looks like we're coming up on the end of the webinar, the 30 minute mark here. So any questions um, that were submitted, we will follow up with you after um, we will reach out individually. So keep them coming if you have any more. And if anyone wants to learn how to get started with any of our solutions, check out the contact us button you'll see at the uh, bottom of your console. And of course, after the webinar today, if you get a second, if you could please fill out our feedback form on what you'd like to see going forward, that will help us decide our future webinar. So thank you again, Bob and Monica. That was super insightful and very helpful, I'm sure, for our attendees today. And thank you for joining everyone. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day.